now from uh, Avid. Uh, Michael Krulik is going to tell us about everything that's new with Avid. This is a version of our beta version of 8.5, which is coming out in December. So you might see some things as I navigate through there. But basically, all of the editorial elements are the same. The first thing I want to talk about is projects. Because again, you do want to work 2K, UHD, 4K, or HD. And you'll see, going into your project settings, you now have the ability to do inside of Media Composer, again, whether Mac or PC, laptop, desktop, UHD, 2K, 4K, HD, and even something we introduced for people who want to do different formats, you can now customize. So you can do 1000 by 200 all the way up to, I think, 8100 by 8100 for whichever way you want to work. Um, but also much to like what Adobe talked about, depending on what computer you have, depending on your storage, is going to dictate basically what kind of performance or what you need to do to get the best playback. So let me just go to um, a project that's already set up because you can also switch between different formats at the same frame rate. Um, and a lot of people are shooting 4K. You are finding that they may not be editing 4K, they may not be delivering 4K, but they may want to shoot 4K to have you know, the full range of shots that they want to work with. Um, you can actually extract multiple edits from single shots. A lot of reality are shooting 4K because they can take one two shot and make that into three separate shots when they're cutting their pieces. They don't need to keep um, uh, editing what they have. So basically the project that I'm opening up is Star Trek Into Darkness. It's a piece that was edited obviously in HD, but the nice thing is you can see the timeline actually kind of impressive. This is the actual timeline from the scene. But if you do want to switch this to be a little higher in quality, you can actually change your formats within the sequence. Right now I'm in HD. I can say let's make this 2K or 4K, whatever we want. We'll go full scope 23. Now the actual project and timeline is switched into a 4K sequence, so you can actually output 4K from here. You can generate a quick time that's 4K. You can generate DPX files. You can actually send 2K, UHD, 4K, higher than HD frames to the VFX house right from Media Composer, and then bring that back in. So all depending on your workflow. Now what happened also when we made this change, when people were changing from SD to HD, we made this great codec called DNxHD. Right? A uh, little tidbit, the first feature film to use DNX HD 36 was the first Iron Man. Um, they actually, the quality was really great, and you could actually screen to audiences off of DNX HD 36. But the interesting thing is DNX HD obviously only goes up to HD formats. So we introduced a new format. If I go to my transcode options, you'll see I now have, when I'm working higher than HD, H, uh, DNX HR. Now, DNX HR is higher than HD. And you'll see LB, low bandwidth, standard quality, high quality, and high quality 10 bit. So, what format do you want to create? You know, you might be, again, shooting 4K, but you're not delivering 4K. And you're actually seeing on network television DNX HD 145. The quality is so good that, you know, when it's being compressed anyway, it really doesn't matter um, depending on how it's being delivered. You can still use 2K, 4K as an archive, but What's your deliverable? Is your deliverable going to be the web? Is it going to be a phone? Is it going to be television? So you can decide how you want to use it. The nice thing about these codecs is they're more efficient. Where are you storing all your 4K footage? Shoot a lot? Guess what? Where are you going to put that? How are you going to store that? How are you going to use it? You'll also see because I'm on a Mac, you can actually create ProRes um, at higher than HD as well, which is nice. Well, you'll also see something we introduced in the latest versions is being able to keep the source frame rate or convert to the project frame rate. You may have heard of mix and match inside of Media Composer. So you can basically throw any frame rate into any sequence that you're working on and it will adapt to that sequence. You're not going to get flashed in error or wrong format as you may be familiar with. And you can actually, you know, when you do your transcode, again, keep your source frame rate. Maybe it's uh, 25 frames into a 23 project. You can choose that. Um, and we also can run in the background. So no longer you're waiting and watching a bar move. Some people call that a break. We now take away all your breaks and you can now render and transcode in the background. 
So you can keep working and then it'll fill that into the um, sequence or project when you're done. Um, also some interesting things, when you are working with this footage, uh, it was mentioned stuff like lookup tables. How are you gonna work with that? If I link to some media, and one thing you'll see when I go into uh, the version 8.5, if I wanna link to some new footage, let me go and create a new bin, you'll see that the new options are, I wanna input, I wanna select, I want to change things. So if I want to input, it's actually giving me all of my input options now. If you're familiar with Media Composer, you used to have to search for the different options. Now yeah. we've actually combined them into one window. And also AMA, is anyone familiar with AMA? Avid Media Access. People are like, why do I have to AMA? You're just linking. So we changed it to link. You're still AMA and you're still linking to digital media, but we're just again trying to make it a little easier for people coming into Avid who are like, what, what's AMA? You're linking to media. So now I link to media, I can choose the format, and here we have all the different formats that you can link to. So again, just like Adobe, we do that too. We can link to every digital format that's out there, and if we don't, we will. Yeah. So you can auto-detect, you can do Aria Alexa, you can um, NEMXF, Panasonic, P2, RED. Uh, but the cool thing, when you are linking to media, let me just link to a single shot up here. Go to this red file. And we'll just take a look at that. So here's the clip. It's actually from Tracy Ullman's show, if you remember Tracy Ullman doing a little piece here. You're noticing that it is stuttering on playback. We're in a 4K project. I'm working on a substandard laptop, right? We do the same thing Adobe does. We had this thing called proxy mode. So if I now want to take that clip, and if I go to format, turn proxy mode, I can turn on a quarter or a 1 16th quality, which actually creates the renders or transcodes on the fly of that clip. You don't have to render and create a proxy. You simply turn it on. Now I'm at 1 16th. You'll actually see the format that it's actually playing at. And now I'm scrubbing that same clip and playing that back. So proxy mode is built into the formats. You could transcode that down to you know, something playable too, but that's a 4K clip playing off of my internal drive in, on a laptop. Now another interesting thing, let's link to another clip. On my desktop, I have this clip right here. Now if I take a look at this, this is, you know, a little movie shot. I know, not very exciting. But the cool thing that I want to talk about is lookup tables. I mean, if you're shooting something and you have a look that's actually built into the camera, you can link to that look when you link to the clip. Or you can extract it, all depending on how you want to work. So if I select the clip and right click on that, you get a source settings selection. So I can go to the source side, and you'll see instantly in color encoding, these are the color transformations that have been added to that clip in the metadata, and it's linking to that instantly. If I take that off, you can go in and say, let's delete that, and we'll delete that. You'll actually see the raw clip right there. This is non-destructive metadata. So you can add, you can remove, Maybe you go into Resolve and create a nice look, a 1D or 3D LUT. You can now install any external LUTs and add them even later to this media. So we'll do a couple of things. I'm going to apply. You'll see it actually pulled it off of the source. It's source side effects, non-destructive. So we'll just go and create a new sequence. I'm just going to drop the single clip into my timeline. And what you'll also see is we've even indicated with a modifier what effect is happening there, whether it's a time warp, spatial, temporal, or color on there. Now, all color has been removed, so we don't see a C there. But if I now go into my source clip and say, all right, let's apply the actual color, the neat thing is it happens on the source. But you may have already cut your 
element into the sequence. You have already cut the shot, you may have already done your piece, and this new look has been created. At any point, I can go to the sequence, zoom in here, and I can say, refresh my sequence by any source side changes, aspect ratio, reformats, colors, time warps, and watch what happens on the record side. It's now changed it in the record. Non-destructive information, we can apply it. If I go to my color management settings under my settings window, you will see it is by default turned on to insert color transformations automatically in the source settings upon linking and ASC CDL values. If that information is in your ALE, that comes in as well and can be linked to. And you can install any new LUTs created externally. And those would come up in a pull-down list. So you'll see on your source settings, all the colors that you can add and any new ones that are added come right through here. The nice thing about that is it's not just source side. If you decide you do want to actually add that color as an effect through the effect palette in Media Composer, you do have under image your color LUT. So if I take that color LUT and just drop that onto my clip right here when I go into the effect editor, I have all of the LUTs that I can apply there as record side effects. So again, giving you a lot of control. Uh, one of the other things I think was talked about is HDR. Now this is the beta version, and one thing we're doing is being able to choose your color space that you want to work in. So we have HDR, all the different settings that you may want to apply to that and work inside of Media Composer. Other things that are kind of cool that are coming down uh, the line with 8.5, again, this is coming out in December. This is actually cool. If I go now and want to add a clip to my sequence, you'll see that it puts it right into the timeline. We now get a ghost. It's not just a wireframe. You can actually turn that on. But watch what happens when I slide up. Oh, it's adding a track automatically. The nice thing about the, the 4K workflows here, when you're doing standard HD workflows, people are doing proxies. They might be working full HD, but when it comes to storage, when you're doing a feature film, when you're doing Big Brother, 24, 24 live feed cameras, and you need to get all that footage in the system, you're not working at HD. You're working at proxies. You're then relinking to those proxies, whether back in Media Composer, whether back in uh, DaVinci, whether in another online system, depending on what you want, you can decide how you want to do it. It's the same thing with 4K. You're going to work with a proxy and then go back to the 4K and link to those files, whether in Media Composer or whether in, um, in another system. And another thing I want to introduce is uh, hardware, because our Nitrous DX hardware only goes up to HD. What we've done is partnered with Blackmagic to give you the DNX I.O., which gives you the ability to connect FireWire or PCIe to your laptop, to your computer, and work 2K, 4K, UHD, or HD. Um, it is supported by Avid, so if you call us, we will actually help support you on that. Um, you can work DNX HR. Uh, if you are encoding DNX HR, that is coming with the next release. We also work, oddly enough, Adobe works with this. Final Cut X works with this. Resolve, other systems, and the Fusion plugin comes with DNX IO. Inside is the Fusion connection with Media Composer, is it's an effect you drop on a Media Composer, it takes you into the Fusion software, you do node-based effects and editorial, come back out, and it's built back into Media Composer. 